The thought that life could be better is woven indelibly into our hearts and our brains. Hello, and welcome to another edition of our weekly personal empowerment podcast, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And, uh... Today in Paradise, we're going to talk about false dichotomies and other lies. The idea that everything is either black or white, right or wrong, good or bad, that there's only two ways of looking at things, that's just not true. And when we get into stressful thinking, out of what we call paradise thinking, into the fight or flight kind of mode, we tend to see the world as black or white, right or wrong, either or. The main problem with either or, of course, is it denies the existence of neither and both. We're teaching what sometimes we call simply paradise thinking. That is, using levels of meditation, guided imagery, visualization, gosh, uh, contemplation, introspection, the closed-eye process you learned in martial arts or yoga class, maybe sports psychology. It's called by brain researchers and scientists the alpha brainwave level. But you don't need some big complicated machine to get there. You go there all the time when you space out. Paradise is going to that daydreaming spaced out place, but with focus and passion. Yeah, instead of spacing out, you could simply think of it as being spacing in. That is, taking your focus, that is your conscious mind, your logical, rational mind, and your passion, your subconscious mind, your emotions, your your part of you that has the enthusiasm, and put them together. Focus your mind and bring all your energy, like take the steering wheel and point it at what you want, take the gas pedal and push it real hard, focused passion, bring the two minds together, and what happens is the awareness that there are these two minds that are working together, the awareness of that, the part of you that is aware, wow, I've got my focus going and i got my passion going right, together, right. that's who you really are. But only when you bring those two together are you able to access that higher consciousness where you can see that you are both the focus and the passion, but you are really the awareness of the focus passion. And so that higher consciousness is a higher self, and that's the self that we teach you every week to find in a paradise that you create in your mind, actually by bringing your heart into your mind, becoming a feeling and thinking in a focused way. And our topic for today, the problem of either or black and white binary thinking, the false dichotomies and other lies that we're talking about today, is that it's an absolute shutdown on creativity, insight, understanding, the third way, the fourth option, the fifth possibility is denied to the individual who allows their stress and anxiety to get the better of them. So why do we do this black or white either or thinking? The answer is very simple. It's the fastest way to make a decision when your life's in danger. Yeah, fight or flight. It's fight or flight. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, so we got into this habit because survival trumps everything else that when we have to make a fast decision, there are only two options, fight or flight. Actually, there are four, fight, flight, freeze, or faint. But freeze and faint aren't things we usually consciously choose to do. Fight or flight either. You know, Those are four things. Human beings rarely freeze, rarely, well, they freeze sometimes, rarely faint. Fight, flight, those are the two biggies, but it's not a conscious choice. It's just we are knee-jerk, operating on autopilot. Yeah, the limbic brain. Yeah. This is the lizard brain. This is the level at which reptiles think. And the level at which all of us think if we're suddenly surprised or perceive danger, real or imagined. But the problem is we're suffering, especially in the West, in America, from such high levels of anxiety. We're so overstimulated that the subconscious mind fears it may be in danger and always looks for the danger, hence a lot of negative thinking, but it tends to be black or white, everything or nothing, and the greatest tragedy of all, that means all differences are opposites and therefore in opposition to you and any variation becomes a threat and now we're in a vicious cycle of fear and anxiety exactly and if something's not right it's wrong you know if you if you look at the world that way if something's not right it's wrong you're either with us or against yeah. us you're a patriot or you're a traitor you're a winner or a loser right. that, that, that's think about that one we have this concept that there's winners and losers so 
So tell me, who's the winner? You got this CEO, this owner of a company who's a multi, multi, multi millionaire, but he's got a, a real dysfunctional relationship and he's unhappy. Or you got this guy who's making barely enough money, but he's got a beautiful relationship, wonderful children, and he's happy all the time. Who's the winner? Who's the loser? To say that there's a way of looking at the world that there, this is the winner and this is the loser doesn't make any sense at all. There's a continuum between any two dichotomies. There's a continuum. There's a rainbow between every black and white. Yeah, people talk about shades of gray, but I like to think of it as a rainbow. And, you know, the Olympics in China have just gone by, and I'm thinking, so a black or white binary thinker, somebody who this happens automatically, autonomically, when you're in a high level of stress and anxiety, and all these ideas in your head are distracted. You're not focused. You're scattered. But they tend to be clustered into an everything or nothing kind of uh, dichotomy, the false dichotomy that would make a silver medal winner in the Olympics a loser because they didn't get the gold. And how absurd is that? That's absolutely ridiculous. Right. You're second best in the world. That would be good enough for me. Oh, well, I would say what's really important is that you do the best you've ever done. Because if you do that, then how can you walk away anything but totally satisfied? I've had lots of experiences with uh, Olympic athletes. I really have enjoyed working with Olympic athletes over the years. And they all do have one thing in common. They all imagine the gold. Even if they think the chances are really remote, they, they think it's not impossible. They think it's possible. And they know the way you create the greatest outcome you can create in your life is to imagine not the probable but the highly improbable the most unlikely but the best outcome you can possibly imagine so if you're if you're taking a look at the idea of seeing the world as winners and losers right or wrong good or bad then you're looking at two outcomes like i'm going to win the olympics or i'm going to lose the olympics and if you're looking at it that way, then no matter what you do, unless you walk away with the goal, you're unhappy. But if you see it like, I'm going to see this continuum of, I already won because I'm at the Olympics, you know, and like, how much more am I going to win in this continuum? The whole thing from, I'm going to, I'm going to, win, the, I'm going to win the best time I ever did. Maybe I'll win the bronze. Maybe I'll win the silver. Maybe I'll win. But it's all win. It's all win. There is no lose once you get to the Olympics. So if you see the world as win-lose, then, well, then you lose. It's it's just silly. I, I, it's understandable, but nevertheless silly to think of a silver medal winner as a loser, or even the person that came in fourth in the world, yeah. because they didn't take home a medal at all. But good Lord, as you said, we could also t look at individuals and all the different areas in which we're talented. You know, somebody who goes to the Olympics probably hangs a big piece of their identity on being an athlete, but... You know, even if they were second in the world or came in 15th, somebody's got to come in dead last in a race or a field event or something like that. But they're still among the best in the world. Indeed. And Indeed. In other areas, we have excellence. The idea of competition can only be taken so far. And in the same sense, we can only go so far with either or thinking. I think to be most persuasive in developing this argument, we need to acknowledge a little, Steve, the nature of either or, of either or as as bifurcation. That's really right. I mean, breaking everything into lists of two, into, two parts. That's right. a real. That's the yin and the yang. Yeah. That's a real good place to begin. Hey, Steve, you coming with me, or did you decide to stay behind? I mean, right. often two is enough. Either this or that. The problem is, it's not a very long list. When you're looking at options and, right. and solutions and, and, and goals and your desires to have only – it's like going to a restaurant and saying, uh, the only decision I need to make is whether I'm going to eat or not. No. You, you have a menu here. You have other choices that we need to make. So if you're coming or not, fine. Two's enough. But my goodness, to limit our lives to either this or that. Everything or nothing. I mean, it's not just either or. It's also everything or nothing, my way or the highway, yeah. dead or alive. And, and what is beauty, visual or beauty in music, but variations? I mean, that's what enriches us. And I'm, I'm noticing in politics this summer, uh, if somebody changes or doesn't even change, but just adds to 
their explanation of where they stand. They're a flip-flopper. Yeah, even if they do change, if they gain new information, they've learned something new, and they realize what, with limited information, they made a mistake in the past, and now they're adjusting and realizing, you know what, I was wrong. Now, I'm, that to me is a politician I like more than somebody who yeah. says, no, I'm going to stick with my old way, even though it was well, wrong. Stay the course. Yeah. I think we've learned the problem. Stay the with- course. Ugh. You know, if you're if you're heading downstream gently, merrily, merrily, then you can stay the course. But if you're fighting the river and you're having a or you bad see a waterfall time doing up it, ahead, don't, <laughs> don't stay the wrong course. You know. Also, the nature of the universe in which we live is cyclic, and cycles have two parts: a yin and a yang, an ebb and a flow. If you just think of stretching a rubber band and pulling it down gently and letting it go, and it vibrates. That creates a sinusoidal wave, a a sine wave, if you remember a little bit of trigonometry. It has a peak and it has a valley, but it also has an in-between. It has that nice slope between the high point and the low point that is the vibration or the frequency. And all energy has to have a frequency or a, a rate in which it vibrates from the positive to the negative, from the height to the depth. Well, There's the basis of understanding, and from there we get gender as well, women and men. So, of course, we're going to think of good guys and enemies or right and wrong. We have to acknowledge that, I think, Steve, just say that it's not enough. Yeah, because, I mean, even if you do say there are good guys and there are bad guys, Clearly, some guys are gooder than others, and some guys are better than others. You know what I mean? It's like... Say that you know that's I don't know that's poor English. You know I know that. It's it, more gooder. It's, yeah, yeah. It's clearly more good. So, there is a continuum of, like, what's a good guy? You know, what, what's good, what's bad? What's success, what's failure? Uh, you know, what's right, what's wrong? I mean, sure. even, even, like, for, I remember, it, I was a little kid, and I took a kind of a iq test when i was a really little kid in school and and it it was adding fractions together Mm. and i added my fractions together and the answer i came up with was two and five fifths which actually of course is three but i just i thought i added all right and i had two and five fifths so i got that wrong now clearly I don't know that I deserved full credit because I didn't, like, bring it all down to the three. But I wasn't wrong. I mean, I had the right answer. I should have gotten some credit because it's not – the world is not right or wrong. Two and five-fifths is the exact right answer, even if I didn't put it in the language. It still showed I understood how to solve the problem. That's that's why right and wrong doesn't just simply work. This is a a great area because uh, this is the way life unfolds. We find a new truth and we accept it. It's less like the flip-flop that we talked about before or so-and-so reversed themselves. That's another one we hear. No, they may have just added new knowledge. Right. And we can see that a lot in science, for example. It's not that new scientific discoveries make the old theories wrong. So much as we see them as incomplete, because now we have this new additional information. Newton wasn't taken away by Einstein. He just was added to. Right. And, I mean, technically, Newton's wrong, but more precisely, was just incomplete. Right. Now, that's smart thinking. Yes. And a stressed brain with too much stimulus, whether it's external stimulus or the internal chaos of the monkey mind is not going to understand a concept like that and is tend to, to fall back to a kind of defensiveness that leads to you're with me or against me, no variations, right? right? You're either on my side or you're not. We even see this in relationships. Right. So let's look at it very, very simply. I mean, intimate, personal. See it most strongly there. You argue with your spouse and it's easy to see how people would often feel like well, whose side are you on? Well, there are no sides in marriage, but it sure feels like it. And it's the stress. It's that stress and the stimulus, I think, that makes the brain look for the danger and give you reasons. That's where all the negative thinking comes from in stress. Right. It, it's rationalizing. It's looking for the reasons why you ought to feel the stress. So as we feel fear, I mean, stress is really based on not feeling safe. We're we're feeling fear. What comes up for us is survival mode. And so we move into the simplest, easiest form of thinking without creativity, the either or the black or right. 
But when we realize we're moving into stress, when we realize we're getting angry or we're getting upset or we're moving out of that place where we feel safe, we're starting to feel endangered, we're starting to feel fear, then if we stop and consciously, with the part of us that is aware of who we are, take a a moment and go, oh, wait a minute now, i I got to shift consciousness. I'm going to take a one slow, conscious, deep breath here. Take myself to paradise. There you go. Take myself to paradise. And now all of a sudden I can do paradise thinking instead of black or white thinking. Now all of a sudden I can see the black and I can see the white. Those are still options. But now all of a sudden I can see a third option and a fourth combination and a fifth possibility and all kinds of other permutations that that maybe a combination of number two and four put together in a new way. All of a sudden I have access to my mind that has creativity. All of a sudden I can unlock what I love to call the power of I, the power of imagination, intuition, inspiration, innovation, ingenuity, insight, ideation, illumination, all the wonderful I words (laughs) that refer to the inductive thinking process. When we're stressed, we move into just that rational, logical thinking, and that's right or wrong, good or bad. But when we move out of that into insight, all of a sudden, gosh, the difference, I mean, the difference between the either and the or, the all the possibilities of different things, the neither of these two or, or both of these two put together, all the possibilities of creativity come forward when we stop. Notice we're having fear and note that fear will take us into more animal brain and love will take us more into human brain. So how do we love ourselves? We love ourselves by being aware of the fact that we were about to go off a place we didn't want to go and we catch ourselves and we go... Uh, we take ourselves to paradise. We close our eyes and we imagine ourselves in paradise. And all of a sudden now we feel safe. We have to feel safe because our brain decides we're safe if we're not ready to run. And it decides we're not safe if we're holding our breath and tightening our muscles and getting ready to run. That's all it has to go by. So if you can do this sigh of relief thing, this ah, relief, and then it knows you're safe. It knows you're safe. And it knows that whatever it's thinking is not going to hurt it and it can release it. I think everybody, if we took a little inventory or a vote, would admit that when we're under some sort of pressure, self-imposed, whatever the nature of it, or some anxiety, we're apprehensive, we're worried and nervous about a situation, it degrades our performance. Yes. Now, there's two kinds, of course, because anxious can be good or bad, right? Like, oh, I'm anxious about the test, or boy, my friend's coming, I'm sure anxious for him to get here. It's like some people do better under pressure. This is called clutch performance. Most people do worse under pressure. This is called choke performance in in sports vernacular. And, 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 of course, it's a matter of how they perceive and respond exactly to the pressure more than the stimulus itself exactly so doesn't it make sense if stress and pressure anxiety in the worst sense of the word degrades our performance whether it's uh, arts and uh, entertainment or whether it's sports or whether it's academic or at work or relationships Uh, This is the confusion that we try to fight with stress and tension and make ourselves even more confused. So wouldn't the antidote be, as Stephen has indicated here, to take a nice, slow, deep breath ah, and feel, with your eyes closed, safe and relaxed, wouldn't it make sense that all that frenzy, all that monkey mind, that roof brain chatter would fall away and leave you with just a single voice? And guess which one? would remain the one that's false or the one that's most likely to withstand that test of feeling safe and relaxed. All these ideas fall away. Well, there's something organically true in the one that remains, right? right? Don't you think? The closer you get to sleep, to that like total surrender, the last voice that remains before you go to sleep, that's not a game you're playing. That's not any false voice. That's the real voice. Fortunately, that voice can come very close to your normal awake state. Once you practice going to paradise, you can just close your eyes and instantly, and in most cases, I mean, there are cases when you're super stressed, it takes a little longer, but in most cases, you can just close your eyes and imagine yourself in this safe place for just a, the time it takes to take one slow, conscious, deep yeah. breath, and, and that's enough time all of a sudden to open your mind up to seeing other possibilities. All right. of a sudden, now you're not stuck in seeing it the only way you used to see it. 
the opposite. Right. Now, all of a sudden, you can see things from other people's point of view. Now, all of a sudden, you can imagine that you've already done this, and you're looking back at how you're doing it. Now, all of a sudden, you can imagine you have a book of solutions, and you can look up the answer to your problem in your book, or you can imagine some historic figure from history comes and helps you. I mean, all of a sudden, creativity opens your mind up to the possibility of seeing this solutions to the situation you're in in so many new ways. Yeah. Now, all differences are not opposite but cover a range of choices. And this is, again, what often in mysticism is called the mystic's path, but in general philosophy is called the middle way. And it's not just the third alternative or the 50-yard line. It's every part of the rainbow, as Steve said earlier, every part of the football field between the end zones. Uh, the end zones are nice. That's where you score. You make a point when you cross over into the uh, end zone, right? You score a touchdown. Well, more than a point, you get six. But actually, the end zones are out of bounds. Yeah, yeah. The extremes, the everything or nothing, the right. all this they or exist, all that. but they're out of bounds. That's not even the playing field. Right. The playing field is the middle, and I don't just mean the 50-yard line. It could be the one-yard line. And so something could be 99% true and 1% not applying, or it could be a 60-40, or for you, a 70-30, but for me, a 30-70, and this is what we mean by the middle way. Now, you know, I have to mention that when Einstein first released the theory of relativity, society in this country... 1905. Was, was it that early? Yeah. I remember reading several accounts of the impact on the culture in the West. And people began to say, well, but that's relative. Well, that yeah. depends. Well, that's a matter of opinion. And many people, well, they call them low-information voters now, people who aren't that well-educated, had a problem with that because they wanted to live in an absolute universe where everything was clear-cut. And we still have those forces today, although they're often those forces that want to control the masses rather than promote liberty or freedom, and fear is a way to do it is all. We have to remember that many things are relative. In fact, there are many philosophies that say all things are a matter of degree or a matter of relativity, that truth is always between the one yard line and the one yard line, you know, it's it's the middle or between the the goals. It's the playing field, right? That's yeah. where truth is. That truth may be never in the extremes, except in the most spiritual or divine sense, and then we leave that to the philosophers. But if in our daily life and affairs we consider, well, nothing's absolute. Nothing is absolute. Everything is relative or a matter of degree. Now we can work with those rainbows. Exactly. And as simply as this, anytime you think that you have to do something you don't want to do, or anytime you think there are only two choices available to me, then you know you're in the wrong kind of thinking. That's a red flag. That's, I mean, that's it. You, uh, you're clear, it's never the case that you always have to do something. There's always options. Maybe this is the best most clearly the best off, but there are always choices. And anytime you think there are only two choices, you're stuck in that same kind of thinking. One choice, two choices, you're not doing paradise thinking. There's got to be at least a third choice. And if there's a third, I'll bet you you can find a way to combine number one and three and make it number four. One of my favorite problem-solving techniques, and we've taught this, you and I, in different ways, uh, uh, permutations and combinations over the years is to say to yourself whenever you're confused and don't know what to do number one i have choices yes and one of those choices of course is to go to paradise and look at your situation in that place where you're more likely to see the third option and the fourth possibility and, and then the second principle after i have choices is I always have more choices than are immediately apparent. So by going to alpha, to paradise thinking, as we like to call it, then the mind quiets, the emotional nature calms, it feels safe and tranquil. All that fight or flight stuff goes away. And now instead of living in a black and white, everything or nothing, you're either with us or against us, you or me kind of world, you create a you and me world. 
Yeah, and essentially if this becomes a lifestyle that is living in this safe mode much of your time, then you start to see the world as a you and me world and not as a, a world that's mostly dangerous with pockets of safety, but instead a world that's mostly safe with some pockets of danger. And you get to, you get to change the nature of the way you look at things. Remember, it's, it really is quite simple. Anytime you're feeling fear, there's your first flag. Anytime you're feeling fear, it's not a red flag. Fear's an orange flag or the orange light on the, the you know, means caution, you know. To, anytime you're feeling fear, like be aware or something's going on here. And that can be anything that hurts emotionally. Exactly. Right? Exactly. I mean, anything. it doesn't have to be eek, I'm afraid. It no, could no, no. be I'm sad, I'm depressed, I'm or, angry. Ouch, I'm, that hurts. Yeah. Or, or yeah, or I'm, yeah, any any of those negative non-love kind of feelings, that's a that's a orange flag at least. Pay, that, pay that, attention that's here. That's a stress. That's, that's a, a fear. That's a stress. Okay, and then there's your sign to, to pay attention. Do you think you only have one or two choices? If, if, if that in that situation you notice, it seems like I don't have any choices or it seems like I only have two choices, that's your signal to get out of that state and take a deep breath, one, slow. The, the key word here is conscious, like you're paying attention to breathing while you're breathing. You know, you're, you're thinking about, I'm, okay, I'm taking a breath here. <sighs> and, and I notice as I take that breath and release it that my muscle tension releases and then my shoulders drop and then, you know, I just feel safe. I just I notice that. But, but Sort of melty. Melty, that's a good word, melty. Uh, and, and I find myself in paradise. I find myself in this beautiful place I created in my mind. Now, I do that, and all of a sudden now, it's not that I have no choice or that I only have two choices. Now, all of a sudden, I have more choices than that, and I realize that as I start to explore those choices, more and more and more choices unfold. Yeah. The nature of the way we think changes. Steve did all those eyes a minute ago. Let's pull on one of the primary eyes. Intuition. Intuition is a dawning. Oh, there's a third way. You didn't figure it out. You didn't use logic, reasoning, rational, deductive, reductionist, take apart thinking. You come to paradise, to this place of safety and peace. The frenzy falls away. You get much more singular in your thinking, much more calm in your emotion, and then something rises up out of that, a light, a dawning, maybe the light bulb pops on, or you're thunderstruck, and you realize something that was within you all along, waiting to be seen, and the tragedy is you were probably never taught to think in this way. Some people pick it up naturally. You'll see them as successful women and men. But a lot of us, if we're not taught, I was taught, and then I went back again and again, took lots of seminars and read lots of books and listened to CDs and podcasts more recently. And I'm always learning more about the nature of intuition. But I just want to point out that that arrives in these paradise thinking states in a much different way than logically, well, in the vernacular, figuring it out. Right, indeed. And and in those states, we need to access to be able to sometimes, quote unquote, figure it out because logic doesn't solve all of our problems by any means. For example, one of the biggest false dichotomies we ever had, we were taught in school that, you know, the problem has this one solution and any other solution is wrong. So there's a right answer and a wrong answer, a right, right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. We got that really embedded in our brain. We were punished when we got it wrong. So we got this idea of seeing the world that way. And we look at our parents and how they parented us. And most people decide that our, their parents were right. That's the way to parent or their parents were wrong. And so I'm going to parent other than that. Most people make that right or wrong decision. I'm going to emulate my parents or they were wrong. I'm going to do it differently. Whereas the huge middle, which would be much, much more effective is they were right at this and wrong at that. They were good at this and bad at that. I'm going to take some of the good, some of the bad. But we don't do that. If we see the world as like there's no middle ground, there's right or wrong, then, then the way my parents parented, either they did it right and I'm going to do it that way, or they did it wrong and I'm going to do it a totally different way. Love and, or hate. Yeah. Yeah. Th those false dichotomies. Love or hate. It's always love and hate. You can't have hate without yeah. love. You can only hate something you're passionate about enough, you know, to yeah. hate. OJ loved Nicole. Oh, indeed. And it's the weirdest and the sickest <laughs> way that I know of. But yeah. 
Yeah, it is. Well, it's important to point out that the amplitude of a positive emotion creates the opportunity for a negative emotion of equal amplitude. Isn't that true? The the secret is you have to go to both places. You just spend the vast majority of your time in the good place and much less of your time in the bad place. And to find the middle, find the whole range, the spectrum in the middle. Life exists in between. That's it. That's where truth is. That's where love is. And... Let me just say one other thing here to create, especially for the visuals. Uh, We talked about the football field as a model where the extremes of right or wrong, good or bad, uh, with us or against us are like the end zones, but the playing field is the middle. The whole field, right, could be 60-40, everything's relative, 90-10, whatever. Here's another nice way to visualize what we're talking about in terms of the middle, and that's the swing of the pendulum. Consider that the swing of the pendulum, there's no point where the weight on the end of this string is not influenced by both extremes. There's no point in the middle where it is not experiencing the falling away from the one pole that it just peaked at and the rushing toward the other pole. In a similar way, there's no point on a bar magnet that is not influenced by both poles of the bar magnet because there's a unifying, harmonizing electromagnetic field around the poles of the bar magnet. That's the middle of the bar magnet and the middle of the pendulum, the only thing that's real. There's no way the pendulum could go so far up or out or swing so widely that it's not part of the whole, that it's not influenced by the other side and will be pulled back. And unless you can create a universe that doesn't have cause and effect, that's true. Yeah. You know, that's clear. That's so the way it's got to be. As the pendulum swings, it's going 75, 80, 85, 90, 99.99%, but it can't quite get to 100 before it swings back yeah. the other way. Okay. Truth is in the middle. And look, if you're in real danger or in the simplest of situations, Bifurcation is your friend. It's a it's a real good place to begin to understand things by sorting them into two parts or, or, or two bits. It's just in the real world, that's not a very long list of options. Yeah, it's, and if you're spending your time like looking for exceptions, so oh wait a minute, this is here's one thing where it's definitely this way or that. Yeah, but the reason we call them exceptions is because they're exceptions. I mean, yes, there are things where you could point out, oh, it always is better to to do this than to do that. But you know, we're talking about the vast majority of your behaviors in life are influenced by the fact that you have it down, that there are only two choices and you chose one of them. And that's the way you are. Now you are a Democrat, not a Republican. You are a uh, person who treats uh, homeless people this way, or you're a person who treats homeless people that way. You've, you've made a decision about who you are and you've seen it as it's either this or that, you know, you're, you're the, and, and, you could be a person who treats homeless people any way in between zero and totally magnanimous. I mean, there's a, it's not you either are nice or you're mean. You know, there's a huge range in between, you know. And if you're having any kind of resistance to this, to accepting it fully or understanding it completely, because some part of you is saying, well, seems like some things ought to be absolute or absolutely true rather than relatively true. And philosophy acknowledges that, capitalizes the A in absolute, and makes reference to spiritual or metaphysical principles that may stand behind the appearance of reality. So you could allow for absolute on that level. Yeah, cause will have effect. We're just saying down here, the way it works out between people is... Mm. Even if it's 99.1, it's still, what if, what if you considered that there was a little bit of truth or some degree of truth in every position? Well, what if, what if you consider that, let's say it's 99.1, that one time out of a hundred, you're going to be wrong. You know, I mean, like the possibility that you could be wrong, even if usually almost or, always you're right. Or this tried and true belief you have right. is, doesn't work in this area. And exactly. Exactly. That the way to treat people is this way. And then all of a sudden you come across this other person and yeah. it doesn't work to yeah. treat them that way. Always worked for me yeah. until I met Joe yeah. and then that didn't work at all. So yeah. Isn't that learning? Uh, isn't that even healing? And isn't that growth and isn't that life? So we've got to be flexible 
you're not here to determine which of two categories events, circumstances, and relationships fall into. You're here to experience the beauty and the richness, the harmony. I mean, imagine if we only had two notes on the piano. Oh, man. Or two colors on our palette. It's not choose from column A or column B. It's choose from every alphabet the human beings ever <laughs> invented and then some. Let's do an audio Let's journey. Do what an, do you say? I love doing audio yeah. journey. So that always starts with uh, that one slow, conscious, deep breath as you close your eyes yeah we're headed for paradise to find ourselves the higher self the better self the more refined self the more balanced and centered self as you find the middle of what appears to be dual in nature, an either-or, an ebb and a flow, the gender of men and women, right and wrong, Republicans and Democrats, winners and losers. There's just so much more. And as you relax now, feeling safe, take another slow, deep breath and allow yourself to wonder about the middle, all the variations and permutations to make life wonderful, you must begin to wonder. It's more important to wonder than to know. Einstein again said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So when you know or think you know what to do, you've eliminated the wonder. So in, even if you do know what to do, you might wonder if there was a way you could do it even better. So instead of doing what matters without wondering if you could do it better, wonder what you could do better before doing what matters. The middle way, the third way is a wonderful way. It leads to the fourth option, the fifth possibility, the sixth choice, the seventh way of looking at things, and you become richer as you determine the relative value and meaning of each of those points of view and each of the responses that you can conjure up from those various points of view. A wonderful life is a rich life. And a rich life, a life of fulfillment, includes an openness to possibilities. To understanding that as rich as life can be, it can be richer. As full as life can feel, it can feel fuller. And by locking into patterns of the right way and the wrong way, all of a sudden, there's no more wonder. There's no more wonder with which to play. So in order to have awe and wonder, in order to feel like the universe unfolds, you have to let go of what you're tightly holding on to. You have to let go of what you hold. And release, and feel the peace, and recognize that in this state of paradise, there are choices, more choices, and more choices appear. And then that brings more choices and more choices and more choices come clear. And all of a sudden, the power that comes with knowing you can choose, in fact, one of the most powerful things that your mind can do, one of the most powerful tools you can use is to choose from a menu not given, but that you create. A menu that allows not just competent, but great. Choice. There are always more choices than are immediately apparent to you. Come to paradise. Come here often. Come here quickly and easily with a quiet mind and the calm heart and disposition that it engenders. 
to realize your choices. You're looking for choices. Consider that great questions are often much more powerful than answers. And beware the hazard of thinking you know the answer. That means you would stop looking for more choices and life would cease to be wonderful. Retain that wonder, that awe, the magic and the mystery of your life from your point of view by red flagging every instance of either or, everything or nothing. I've only got two choices. You're either with me or against me. Move from that kind of you or me world in this place of perfect peace to a you and me world where I can understand you and acknowledge the truth in your position. Steve, I can understand how you'd feel that way. I don't agree. I've got a different idea. Maybe you could understand that, and we could agree to disagree. And harmony is in the middle. Harmony is when two voices sound good together, not sound the same. So we're talking about ways that we can find paradise with others as well. It's not about right and wrong. It's about finding a way where we can have a win-win, finding a way where we can both get our agendas met, finding a way where we can both have our needs met. There's always two losers when there's a winner and a loser, you know, because the winner loses in a relationship when the person that they're in relationship gets hurt. There's, there's only two losers in that scenario. So seeing a relationship as a win-lose, seeing a relationship as a right-wrong is always way too limited. Remember, simply remember. Whenever you think there's no choice, well, that's closed-minded, and that's locked into habit, and that's knee-jerk. Whenever you see only two choices, then that's fear thinking. That's being afraid. That's being in this limbic brain, uh, right or wrong, either or, black or right, fight or flight mode. Whenever you stop and take one uh, slow, conscious, deep breath with your eyes closed, find yourself in paradise, all of a sudden other choices will come apparent, a third way, a middle way, which leads to fourth, fifth, sixth, and many other options, alternatives, and possibilities. And you can come here, as you're doing now, for eight, ten minutes or more. Remember, however, that you can easily come here with a single breath in a matter of moments, revitalize, refresh, and restore yourself with new information from this wonder and this awareness of the trap of binary thinking and limiting yourself to bifurcation, looking for the third way, experiencing that as an adventure of wonder always looking at mystery, using questions as if they were more powerful than answers, continual improvement, expansion, more and more. And at work, when it comes to more than two people creating a you and me world out of a you or me world, when we factor in a third person and a fourth and we talk about teams, I'd like you to consider this. Board meetings should happen around rectangular tables. There is a hierarchy. But teams should meet around round tables, where everyone is an equal participant, working for the common good, but bringing their unique and diverse talents and skills to that oneness. That, again, is creating unity out of the strength of diversity through harmony and can you feel it, how harmony is in the middle of the one and the many, of the whole team and its separate individuals, even in the greatest sense of life as one thing, and yet filled with so many separate, and not just separate, but absolutely unique, there's an absolute, absolutely unique and diverse forms wouldn't it be harmony in the middle, the third way, that allows us to understand the validity of all points of view and bring those rainbows into your black and white world? For if you're living in a world of right and wrong, you've not taken into consideration the concept that 
you're right from your side and I'm right from mine. There's always the possibility that you're looking at two different problems and you think you're looking at the same problem, but you're right from looking at the problem the way you think the problem is, but someone else could see a totally different problem looking at what you think is the same problem. So there's always got to be space for that. There's always got to be space for the possibility that, that even though you are right, the other person could be right from their point of view as well. And, and so that takes away the right and wrong way of looking at things. And, and whenever you're, you're limiting yourself to right and wrong, understand that, yes, there are some things that are true, capital T, and false, capital F. There's no doubt about that. And, and there's some things where life presents you a multiple choice test. There's only two or three choices, but mostly it's an essay. You know, mostly it's a story you get to write, and you get to write all kinds of possible answers, and you get to write all kinds of new answers you never thought of. And if you take a deep breath and do some paradise thinking, all of a sudden the possibilities are limitless. Feel how it feels to wonder about the unlimited nature of the choices before you. Those that are immediately apparent, those that are a little less obvious, and those dreams as yet undreamed. Be wonderful. Red flag those either-or moments and know that the third way is more than one more choice. But the middle. Feel the freedom and the joy of knowing you can bring rainbows, harmony, into a very adverse world and the many situations of animosity and adversity and conflict that we all face from day to day. Feelings you can bring with you easily and effortlessly as you now reorient yourself toward the sound of our voices. And remember, any time fear says you have no choice, or there's only one, then you'll hear a voice, and that voice will say, Stop and breathe and recognize and just believe that there are more choices, more choices, more choices to choose. With the deep breath, the thought that there's only two is removed. There are other choices. Pay attention whenever you feel the fear to take a deep breath and find paradise, find paradise back here. Anytime you want to, you can always return. It's an easy place to go to. All you need to do is yearn to return and deep breath and you're there. This perfect place of paradise where you can see other choices, hear other voices, know from your higher self that here in paradise, everything you think is best for your personal health. So, listening to our voices as you take a deep breath... <sighs> reorient yourself to the room you're in and bring yourself now back to wide awake. I love that. Yearn to return. Well, why don't you share your yearn to return to FocusedPassion.com with friends and associates, co-workers, employees, maybe even tell your boss, the one at home and the one at work. <laughs> About FocusedPassion.com where there are these podcasts for 99 cents a week, premium podcasts, an hour with an audio journey, very, very valuable. Share your yearn to return, your yearn to learn by bringing all your friends to FocusedPassion.com. And so as always, thanks for listening and be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. The thought that life could be better is woven. Into our hearts and our brains.